Um, the reason they're falling through the floor like that is because this mod was made for a previous version of the game, and then there was an update, so... Look at them! They're all stacked up. Here they come! Oh lord, they coming! Uh, who's this one? Cloudy. Uh, no, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, what did I do? I think I just put her to the trade center. Um, bye, Cloudy. I'll follow Mr. Gates here. What a handsome boy! Such a handsome boy! Ah! He's spazzing out because, uh, again, because I'm using an outdated version of the mod. Um, he's got his little ducky bill! You're probably wondering, like, if I love dinosaurs so much, why not just play an actual dinosaur-related zoo game? Like, uh, Jurassic World Evolution. Um, of course I play Parkosaurus, uh, where they're like cartoon dinosaurs, but cartoon dinosaurs are not quite as fun as real ones. Um, thing is though, I don't fuck with the Jurassic Park franchise, um, because of their horrific, horrific practices of animal cruelty. And I think, I think this mod actually was, the image was imported from the Jurassic World games. You can tell because his feet are messed up. Really, uh, and Montosaurus is supposed to have, like, they had, like, bird feet in the back, like this, but in the front, they had, like, they had, like, goddamn fucking, like, horse paws. Like, they would have, like, walked on their toes, on their three middle fingers, and their whole, like, fingers would have been fused into, like, a little hoof. So they had, like, these horse paws with the thing sticking out of the side. And their big hind feet. Um, oh no, I think he's gonna escape. <laughs> I don't think I uh, thought that out very well. Oh no, they're escaping. They're just climbing right over there. <laughs> oh well. Um. Yay, look at her go! She's so pretty. <laughs> it's just spazzing out. It's okay. They they can be spazzy. This is a safe space. They can just spaz out and enjoy their little habitat that I made for them. High amounts of litter. Didn't ask. Uh. Especially you, Jazzy. Do you get bothered by litter, Jazzy? Uh, I think she's pooping. Oh, this group of dinosaurs, they're called Hadrosaurids. They include, obviously, Edmontosaurus, Hadrosaurus itself, <laughs> but also other pretty popular ones like Parasaurolophus and Lambiosaurus and the ones that I was going to put in the zoo with, like, Myasaura and Centaurosaurus. But, you know, the duck-billed dinosaurs, basically. And uh, oftentimes, they're pictured as walking on their hind legs with their little pawsies hanging in front of them like you would see with a theropod. And that's how they were depicted for years and years and years by like the early paleo artists. You can think of like Ducky from the, what's that one? The Don Bluth movie. Um, Land Before Time. <laughs> uh, so dinosaur nerd I am. Um. And they could walk on their hind legs, but they think that they would walk on their hind legs when they were babies, but when they got really, really big as adults, they would transition to being quadrupeds. So they did not have paws in the front. Like, they didn't have, like, you know, like a, like a paw with a pad on it like they show here in the game. They had hooves in the front, but they could rear up on their hind legs pretty easily because they had such big legs. 
and they could uh, run on their hind legs. Like a lot of the modern, um, scientifically most well-founded paleo art and animation, they always show hadrosaurs like rearing up on their hind legs and then they they run like Naruto and they hold their front legs back and they just run on their hind legs and it's the cutest thing in the world. Of course, you know, we can't necessarily know 100% what they would have ran like in real life um, and probably a animal that's as big or bigger than an elephant wasn't doing too much running. <laughs> But yeah, they didn't really walk on their hind legs like we usually see, except for when they were babies. Um, and they were they were four-legged animals with hooves. My favorite type of dinosaur changes every week, but I really do like hadrosaurs. They're pretty interesting little critters, or big critters in this case. I believe that they had the most complex teeth of any animal that has ever lived. Like, in terms of, like, the tooth structure itself, like, the types of different, like, layers and tissue in the teeth, and their teeth were arranged in, like, this, like, perfect machine grinding system for plants. Like, they could chew, like, nobody's business. Um, they put any cow or horse to shame and like the way their jaw worked like they had like this weird kind of like jaw that would like chew up and out instead of like side to side like horses do i can't describe it and nobody has ever been able to explain <laughs> to me uh how it works even with an animation but um i love them so much all of the hadrosaurs i just love them so much I think we were going to talk about Jurassic World Evolution, uh, but uh, I have to talk about hadrosaurs first. Um, Alright, I want you to imagine this for me. You are watching a movie, and uh, it's like a CGI movie, and there's a human character. And, you know, it's, a, it's animation, so you don't expect it to be super realistic. But, you know, we expect it to at least look like a human being if it's a human character, right? But let's say that you're watching this movie, and for one reason or another, all of the humans in it are completely bald. Every single one of them. And not just the men, but the women and the children, too. It's not part of their character or anything. Nobody ever mentions it. But they're all bald. And also... Uh, every now and then, the animators draw their arms, um, their elbows bending backwards, like they're, like, about to break, like, hyperextending backwards, like some kind of freak of nature from a horror movie. And you'd watch it, and you'd like, ew, that looks painful, man. It would just elicit, like, all of the squeamish body horror instincts you would ever have if you saw a video of even an animated movie of somebody's arms bending backwards, especially if they tried to make these people look realistic. But for one reason in the movie, uh, nobody ever questions why they're all bald and they bend their arms back in a way that would break them, or why they look like these sickly freaks of nature. Like, the, the movie just goes on as if, as if that's, like, what a human is supposed to look like. Like, the animators had just never seen a human before, and they just kind of did their best, you know? And, like, whatever. Uh, that's what we gotta do. We do our best. Uh, uh why does the Jurassic Park franchise engage in horrific, horrific animal cruelty? Just absolutely unforgivable. I'm gonna get out of here real quick. And I'm going to show you what Jurassic Park did to their animals. This is quote unquote blue. I think she's supposed to be some kind of dromaeosaur raptor. Um, and as you can see, she's not doing so hot. Um, all of her feathers have been plucked out. I think she probably did that herself because, you know, when you put a bird in a stressful situation and you don't care for it well, they pluck themselves bald as a form of, like, self-injury. So I bet that's probably what happened to her. Um, and also, they broke her wrists. Look at this. Look at this. Okay, now watch this. I'm just gonna break the wrist and walk away. Break the wrist, walk away. Jeez. Look at the way her... 
Oh, God. Oh, Jesus Christ. Look at that. Oh, she's a baby. Chris Pratt, what did you do to her? What did you do, Chris Pratt? Oh, poor baby. Oh, God. Look at that. Look at that. Okay. Um, because the thing is, though, uh, you're like, is that not a velociraptor? And, uh, no, that is not a velociraptor. I'll show you what a velociraptor looks like. This, this is a velociraptor, okay? Um, and you can see that blue has been severely, severely abused. Um, first of all, first of all, what direction are her hands pointing? Um, they're pointing inward, right? Like she's holding a little basketball so she can flap her wings, right? And those feathers, you know, that's not just like paleo art speculation. They know that they had them because they find the feathers fossilized on close relatives of Velociraptor. For example, Microraptor and also Velociraptor itself. The arm bones have the notches of where the quill feathers go or the flight feathers attach. Um, see, like, there's her hands in the natural bird position where they go, just like Microraptor, just like Utah Raptor. And look, look over here. We have Gorgosaurus. What direction are his hands facing? Inside, like he's holding a basketball, which is the natural godly position of how a dinosaur's paws should go. Okay, look at this, look at this freak of nature. This is Therizinosaurus. Even this ungodly freak still has wholesome, inward-pointing, flappy arms. Or or this big boy, this absolute unit, inward-facing posies. That's that's how they go. That That's how their arms go. And if you try to turn them, like if you try to pull them out and turn them downward, it'll break their arms. Have you ever seen a living dinosaur put its arms forward and hold them in a downward facing motion? No, look at that. Look at how his hands use are facing. They go out and then they meet in the middle like they're clapping. See, look, you can even see it up close right here. There we go. If you were to, if you were to do that to a bird, um, you would be evil and it would hurt them. So if you're not going to do it to these birds, why would you do it to this bird? Okay? She doesn't deserve that. And just horrific, horrific animal cruelty. And I just cannot engage in the Jurassic Park franchise because every time I look at this, it just makes me so uncomfortable. How can it not? How can, how can a sane, rational person look at that? and not have their hearts break for these poor animals and the suffering they are obviously going through. <sighs> tisk, tisk, tisk. Tisk, tisk. You know, at the time that the original Jurassic Park movie was made, the idea of feathers on theropod dinosaurs, it was under debate, but a lot of scientists were like, mm, I don't know about that, man. It was still up for debate at that point, so it makes sense why they didn't do it for the movie. It was considered to be somewhat speculative. Not outside the realm of possibility, but speculative, you know. You don't want to be too speculative. Also, it probably would have been a little bit more expensive to do it that way. I feel like in the Jurassic Park original movie, there was like this attitude of respecting animals for the sake of them being animals. Like, what is the first thing that the scientist says to his friend, or I forget which scientist said it, it might have been the girl one. <laughs> They do move in herds. They're like, they do move in herds. As soon as you see this, like, big, huge animal, and it's beautiful and magnificent, and you get to just appreciate it for its natural beauty. The character just, uh, that's what they notice, is just that it's just being an animal, and they're just appreciating it for being itself, you know? Well, that was kind of a theme in the movie, I feel like, is that like these are animals. They deserve to be respected as animals. They're not toys, and they're not commodities. 
So, like, you know, and the bad guys are the ones who want to commodify the dinosaurs. They want to bring them to this world to suffer and be sold. And they and they do actually make the animals suffer in a way. Like, in the book, at least, they made the dinosaurs all lysine deficient. They couldn't produce the amino acid lysine so, you know, that the animals would be easier to control. And also so that when they sold them as pets, the owners would be forced to buy special pet food for them. And of course, you know, they were able to find Lysium out in the wild. That was a detail that was in the book, Jurassic Park. One of my favorite books when I was a teenager. And that theme is also explored in in the new Jurassic World movie, if I remember. <laughs> Look at me spazzing. Are you okay, little guy? Uh, apparently not. <laughs> Should I help him? I think I'm gonna help her. The, you remember the evil capitalist lady with the red hair who runs in high heels? Um, she was like, she kept referring to the animals as like assets or things like that. Just like being like stereotypically evil capitalist. And Chris Pratt is like, um, excuse me, uh, this is my animal that I care for and uh, it's intelligent and I love it. And I do think it is kind of interesting that they decided to make the main character of their story, you know, a working class person. <laughs> I feel like there's a little bit of class conflict going on in the in that movie. Um, it's been a while since I saw it. I'm probably, like, completely remembering the plot wrong. <sighs> oh boy, they're, like, really spazzing out. Like, that is, like, the least sexy-looking orgy I have ever seen. <laughs> I love them so much. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, so that was the point, and, like, Chris Pratt is like, no, you can't hurt my baby Blue, um, you can't use her as a weapon, and where, as everybody else just thinks of these animals as, you know, commodities. But I think it's just a little bit ironic, though, that, like, uh, yes, at the time that the original movie was made, we did not know that theropod dinosaurs were usually feathered, but now we do. And so they, I guess they left the original design in order to be, um, I'm just going to copy and paste, uh, habitats that I previously made, because why the fuck not? Like, why would I, why would I make my life more difficult, you know? That's not necessary. I can't see where the path is, because it's fucking snowing. There it is, okay. This is, this is apparently where, uh. The path is going to be now. Get rid of that thing. But that was that was a theme of the movie was that these are natural animals, not toys, not commodities. But I think it's kind of ironic though because uh because in the movie, while they're criticizing that practice of treating natural animals as things as commodities. Um, I think, you know, even in the movie, the lady says something like, you know, you guys didn't want natural dinosaurs. You wanted something big and scary. And so that's what we gave you. And they create this like weird fucking hybrid animal that's like really gross and sickly looking. And she says that in the movie, but that's exactly what the movie is doing to the animals themselves. Because in order to be close to like the original canon, they're, they don't want to make a velociraptor they want to make the animal that was in the movie there's no reason why the design of the animal can't change in between installments you know in star trek they do it all the time with the klingons like uh you know the klingons aren't worse just because they look different you know it's not what the klingons look like that is interesting about them it's the fact that they are interesting characters who play an interesting role in the story that makes them interesting <sighs> So why couldn't they have, for the, the sequel, you know, made the animals look more to reflect current scientific understanding? Because they don't think that they can sell a realistic animal to the audience. That's why. And they don't want to try to challenge the audience to actually think about these animals as real animals that really live. They want them to think about them as movie monsters. And it's like the movie's like calling itself out. And I don't know, I don't know if the whole thing is supposed to be like 10 levels of 3D chess irony that they're doing the exact same thing that they're criticizing in the movie. But whereas the dinosaurs in the original movie were natural organisms that were celebrated for their natural wonder, 
they weren't scientifically accurate, but they were um, as accurate to the best of current knowledge at the time. In the next one, we get movie monsters. And so these animals in the movie are not animals, but commodities. They're being sold to the audience to give the audience a particular feeling. Like, I don't, I just don't understand, like, why do they have to make a, it, I don't know. It's just, it's, if it wasn't so uncomfortable to look at, maybe I wouldn't care. But I don't know. It just kind of makes me sad when I see it because I don't like people talking about these animals as if they're movie monsters, as if they exist only for the purpose of entertaining audiences in a capitalist consumer market. I want people to think about them as natural things, to appreciate them as part of nature. I want people to treat dinosaurs with the same love and respect that we give to lions and tigers and bears <laughs> and a you know a majestic bald eagle and just to appreciate them for what they are not the feeling that is being sold to us when we look at them in some kind of product and you know i guess that's just kind of something that the jurassic park story really tries to focus on is that idea of like the commodification of life the commodification of nature and it is really an, an anti-capitalist book, I think. Uh, Michael Crichton, a lot of his work does have lots of anti-capitalist themes, I feel. He kind of went off the deep end later in his career when he started getting into like weird climate denial shit. But uh, I definitely appreciated his books when I was a kid. I think that if I were to read them now as an adult who has been politically radicalized, you know, maybe... Maybe I might find something else new to appreciate them as I'm looking back. But if, like, the, if the commodification of fake dinosaurs <laughs> bothers me, even more troublesome is the commodification of real dinosaurs, you know, actual animals that are found in the ground. And this is, like, a huge problem that is actually happening in the paleontology world. And, like, I watch a lot of, like, paleontology YouTube videos and podcasts and uh, I just fucking love dinosaurs, okay? It's a huge problem in paleontology right now. Like, you know, all of these fossils, these amazing fossils that have been found, that they sit in, like, boxes in the back of warehouses for years and years and years because people are arguing about who owns them. Sue the T-Rex is a kind of a famous story of that. There was a documentary about um, how the guy who found her actually spent time in jail because he had unknowingly dug her up off of federal land like what happened i think the, the land that he f found her on um was was supposedly under the ownership of some native tribe either it was the tribe or it was just a person a landowner who happened to be native and so he dug her up with permission of the person that he thought was the rightful owner of that land and uh <laughs> Uh, I think it goes without saying that, yeah, indigenous people are the rightful owners of the land, but legally, under the laws of the bourgeois state, they were not. And so it actually was federal land, and so the guy ended up spending time in jail. And Sue, she just got sold, and she sold for like six million dollars, and thank, thank God, thank the lucky stars that she was bought by the Field Museum and not some private collector because she was up for auction. You know, anybody could have taken her who could have afforded it. But, you know, had that happened, uh, she would have been lost to science. And that actually did happen recently. There was a T-Rex named Stan who was lost to science because he was bought by a private collector for like 28 fucking million, I think it was, or like $30 million or something absolutely ridiculous. And now some rich asshole has Stan in his basement and he's lost to science and people can't study him anymore because some rich asshole thinks it would be cool for him to have a dinosaur in his house. It's not appreciating Stan for the natural animal that he was. <laughs>
and it, and it freaked a lot of paleontologists out that Stan sold for that much because like if that happens there's going to be this new market for these fossils and um if the fossils are that expensive um it's not going to be underfunded scientific institutions <laughs> who are going to have the option to find them and keep them you know uh <laughs> It's going to be the people who can afford it, which are capitalists and their various uh, less than noble intentions. It's really upsetting that, that this happened for a lot of scientists. And for me as a dinosaur lover and anti-capitalist, it's upsetting for me too. There was a... I forget exactly what it, the fossil was. I think it was... I think it was something like really insane. It was like a baby T-Rex fighting a Triceratops fossil. The, the people who dug it up dug it up from their own land, I'm pretty sure. But they happened to not own the mineral rights to their land. Somebody else owned the mineral rights to that land. And so these fucking, like, sleaze balls, when they heard that this this huge fossil had been dug up that was insanely valuable and worth potentially millions of dollars, they went to court and said, no, uh, we own the mineral rights, therefore we own this mineral fossil. And I'm pretty sure the court ruled that, like, okay, that's a stretch, you know. It's not a, you know, <laughs> they're not minerals as in, as in iron or copper or whatever. <laughs> they're dead animals that happen to be made out of minerals so thankfully the court called bullshit and yeah but i forget how much that one sold i think it was like 10 million um but yeah thankfully thankfully that one did i'm pretty sure end up in scientific hands and so like the ethics of digging up fossils and collecting fossils is like hot shit right now it's a hot debate because, yeah, they are often, in terms of capitalist commodification, insanely valuable. They're finding a lot of, like, really impressive fossils in amber in Myanmar. You know, they mine a lot of amber in Myanmar for jewelry, but the practices that they engage in are just horrifically violent and exploitive. But they're finding all these like really impressive fossils in there. And so the question is like, do we the scientists buy these fossils or obtain these fossils and study them and write about them? Or should we respect the fact that these fossils were dug up when they really should not have been, you know? They should not have been dug up under the circumstances that they were. And if we buy them, and if we create a demand for them, we're just going to encourage these violent exploitive practices. And I think fossils are rare, but you also you also could find them everywhere. So I think I think until we um, overthrow capitalism in Myanmar, we can we can hold off on using the fossils from there. And also, like, there's the issue of fossils being taken from poorer countries that are the victims of colonialism. Um, like, there was a paper published on some fossil that was taken out of Brazil, but it had been taken illegally. So in Brazil, there's a law that says that people who dig up Brazilian fossils, they're not allowed to leave the country, and any paper published on them has to have at least one Brazilian scientist who works on it. But, you know, some guy from some wealthy capitalist core country just decided fuck you i'm gonna take him up and study him anyway and if i remember the details correctly his paper that he wrote on that fossil was thankfully retracted like just like artifacts and pieces and art are being stolen out of poor countries so are fossils and so are other natural resources so like the the trafficking of fossils and the trafficking of these animals uh, they're dead, but they're still animals, and they still should be loved like any other animal. It's reflective of the same forms of exploitation and violence against human beings, not just against nature, but against human beings, that exists in every single other aspect of how we treat nature. It exists in the way we treat minerals dug up from mines in poor countries, the way we treat lumber cut from tropical forests of poor countries, or the amber that's dug up in poor countries. So yeah, I do think it's a big deal that we treat dinosaurs as commodities. And here I am, like, playing a game that is in itself kind of a way of commodifying animals, you know, like, you can buy all the DLCs that have the new animals that you can add to your collection, um, but, you know, zoos are kind of like that too, you know, they treat the animals as 
an attraction as a commodity. And, you know, zoos do a lot of really good, wholesome work, but in order for them to fund their work, you know, of preserving this these animals and caring for them and making sure they're protected from extinction, they have to commodify them in the process. And, you know, that is what it is. So, like, under socialism, like, what is our relationship going to be to nature, you know, to animals dead and alive? Obviously, we're still going to have zoos under socialism because zoos are fucking cool and everybody likes to go to the zoo and also they do a lot of important work in conservation and whatnot. I think to to say that humans have no right to use nature at all is to say that humans have no right to be alive. Um, you know, we have to use nature in order to be alive. But, you know, under socialism, the way that we use nature, it can be very different. You know, we don't have to follow the rules where if something isn't 100% profitable, we can't do it. You know, we could have a vote over the way our natural resources are used and the way living things around us are treated um, and the way we relate to them. We're not doomed to just repeat the capitalist patterns. And that was actually, you know, an interesting question. I actually had a chance once to speak to a classroom of kids. Um, long story, you know, about socialism, me and some comrades of mine went and we gave a little presentation to the class. And one of the, the high school students asked us, what's the socialist response to like animal rights? And it was kind of an interesting thing because I hadn't really thought about it. Because to be honest, I've kind of always thought of the animal rights movement as a little bit uh, petty bourgeois, you know, like people are more concerned about animals than they are about people and sometimes even at the expense of people like vegans who think they're fucking god incarnation on earth because they eat you know all these exotic fruits and vegetables that are grown with slave labor instead of an animal god forbid you kill a pig i mean if you are a vegan and you're watching this you obviously have a right to put whatever into your body that you want or to not put into your body whatever you want and I admire you for going through that trouble to live out your principles and to do what you feel you need to do for your health. But, you know, I do think that the vegan movement has a lot of problems. But, you know, it struck me because I hadn't really thought of it before. And I think what the answer I gave her is like, well, you know, I don't know what our relationship with animals is going to be like in a socialist world. But what I can tell you is that we, the working class, we're not just going to be at the mercy of whatever food happens to be for sale in the grocery store. We, the consumers and the workers who raise these animals, will have a say over how that happens. We can end practices like factory farming if we, the working class, decide that that's what we want to happen in our world. And since our farms and our land will no longer be controlled by just a few individuals, we actually will have the power to make that happen. We don't have to wait for the fucking Tyson people or whoever to choose to do the right thing or be forced to do the right thing by law. We can decide for ourselves how those farms are operated. We can decide for ourselves how our forests are managed, what resources we extract from the forest. We can decide for ourselves, you know, what happens to fossils that are dug up from the land. And, um, and I look forward to the day where we will very happily... Um, expropriate Stan and return him to the museum. Just just go back. We're coming for you, Stan. Just barging into this rich asshole's basement. Just like, we're coming to get ya. And then we carry him out bone by bone. Hopefully they don't modify him or damage him. And let's pray to Jesus that they don't separate his bones. We're coming, Stan. We love you. You know, the workers who work in the mines, in those amber fields, they're going to be the ones who get to decide how those, how that amber is mined and what happens to the things that are found there. That's what's going to get to happen. Indigenous people are going to get to decide what happens to valuable treasures, including natural treasures that are found on their rightful land. We won't be confined to capitalist ways of doing things. We will have a choice to do something different. And uh, if we do choose to bring back dinosaurs, and you know, I'm not 100% against it, we can choose to treat them ethically and we can choose to, to use them for the purposes of educating people and learning about the natural world. And, uh, and we can just 
love them and uh I love you so much. Etic Talek. Look look at this. This is a good dinosaur model. Um I love this mod. I don't know if this was a Jurassic World Evolution mod, but look how nice it is. Look at this. First of all, her her arms are in the right position. You know, she's got Look at the, look at the markings on her. Look how dramatic that is. That's beautiful. She has the realistic body integument that you would expect for a warm-blooded animal that lives in the Arctic. Dinosaurs, like, ancestrally, not just, like, later ones that were more closely related to birds, but, like, way back in the Triassic, maybe even before they evolved to be dinosaurs, were warm-blooded. And so they most definitely did have fluffy body integument. Uh, so you have to put feathers on your dinosaurs because otherwise they will be cold. Not all dinosaurs had feathers, you know, because we have skin imprints from, like, ornithopods and stuff, and they definitely did not have feathers big theropods like T-Rex or Spinosaurus, it's still up in the air. Um, I think the consensus is that they probably had feathers as babies, but then lost them as they got older. Because, you know, if you put fluff on a huge elephant-sized warm-blooded animal <laughs> that lives in a warm tropical or semi-tropical environment, um, it's gonna die of heat stroke. <laughs> its brain is gonna cook. What I heard is that the most recent uh, accepted idea is that T-Rex probably had some feathers on, like, its head and its shoulders just for display purposes. You know, just to be brightly colored, to attract mates and whatnot. But it probably would have been bald on the rest of its body. But, you know, we do know that feather tyrannosaurs did exist. There's a couple feather tyrannosaur animals that were found in China. This one, Nanuxaurus, is a small tyrannosaur that is from Alaska. Like, dinosaurs lived on, like, the fucking North Pole. It was rad. And it's a, it's a little one. I thought they were bigger than this, but look how cool they are. It's not as big as a T-Rex, but it's just as cool. All the tyrannosauroids are cool. Even the little ones and the big ones. A Tiktaalik is about to mate. Oh, sorry to intrude on you. Oh. Oh. What's going on? What happened to Arizona? How did she get stuck up there? Did she spaz out? Look how cute she is. You're gonna have babies! Like, uh, when I used this mod before, the baby ones, when they're born, are just so cute. I love them so much. Yes, put feathers on your dinosaurs um, when when appropriate. Don't make your big theropods die of heat stroke. But uh, definitely your little guys, you know, keep them warm. Not just the theropods, too. Uh, make sure your tiny basal ornithopods and uh, ceratopsians also get the warmth and love that they need. And look, there's a baby in Montosaurus! And it's spazzing and falling through the floor. <laughs> you came from the earth. Your fossils were dug from the earth and to the earth. You are returning. Treat treat your dinosaurs like animals, like natural animals and not movie monsters. Uh, and give them the same love that you would give to any animal alive today. Don't let capitalism ruin dinosaurs. <laughs>